bite marks, internally there are major differences. Uh, a stab wound obviously is a lot different uh, from, a, uh, from a bite mark because you don't get the penetration that you will get uh, when someone stabs you with a knife. So you can actually trace the, uh, uh, the knife wound down inside the body itself. Very often, uh, people who are trying to, uh, to cover up their, uh, uh, their criminal activity on the body by throwing it in a, uh, a lake or a pond that contains alligators, thinking that alligators are going to destroy it, uh, they are very disappointed. For crime scene investigators, these big predators must be taken into consideration. Not just for the dead, also for the living. Take it slow. Yeah, just slow, and uh, so we don't stir up the water. Okay. It's always interesting to try and recover a body from the habitat of wildlife that you know has a taste for humanity. I probably want to get some photographs of the body from this position. Just, just hold it right here. So uh, it, it causes a, a bit of alarm, security. You need to react, be smart. Uh, and not overextend yourself to the point that uh, you become vulnerable uh, to that wildlife. We know right here in this area that, uh, you know, the alligators that are here, we, we don't want to have any conflict with them. We're in their habitat, and uh, so, so they're not happy that we're here. A shark is, is, I suppose, a killer's best friend in the ocean. Uh, but uh, sharks very rarely will consume an entire human being. And, and that, I think, is the catch. Uh, while parts of the body may be removed, uh, usually there is enough left to make identification. Uh, and, and then, in many cases, there's enough left to develop cause of death as well. So uh, it's, no, it's no, uh, no certainty that if you deposit your, uh, a dead body in the ocean uh, that it's not going to come back to haunt you. The ever-evolving quest to get away with murder. Some killers turn to nature. Others take a more hands-on approach. For some murderers, killing comes easy. He's nothing but a big mouth. It's getting rid of the evidence and masking the victim's identity that presents the greater challenge. Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Roger Mittelman has seen it all. Criminals conceal their crimes by the usual things people think about, in other words, by burning the bodies and hoping that nothing will be found or by taking the bodies and putting it in a body of water or putting it in a ditch. These are the usual ways people try to conceal that a murder has occurred, but there are more unusual ways as well. In 1995, Dr. Middleman was called in to help unravel one of the most thorough cover-up attempts Miami had ever seen. Killers working an extortion and kidnapping scheme abducted a wealthy couple, chopped their bodies to pieces, and dumped the remains throughout the county. Well, in the Griga case, we found the torsos first in the 55-gallon drums, and then later on, the skulls and portions of the hands and feet were found in smaller buckets in a different area of the Dade County geography. In their gruesome attempt to hide the victims' identities, the killers cut off their heads, hands, and feet. They also sawed off their faces. Though the bodies were severely damaged, certain parts could still provide clues. Once investigators knew who the victims were, it wasn't long before they tracked down the killers. Noel Dorbal and Daniel Lugo. Now, when the skulls turned up later, we were then able to do other things. Obviously, the age, race, and sex, anthropologically, was that of the victims. But what had happened was they had cut the faces out of the skull, but they got sloppy. They got sloppy in the sense that one tooth 
was left in the male skull. That tooth had a filling, we had his dental records, and then we were able to say, that's him. By association, that's her. Breast implants and an IUD found in the female victim confirm her identity. What seemed like the perfect crime put Dorball and Lugo on death row. Their cover-up blown out of the water. Criminals go to great lengths to destroy and cover up their physical evidence. However, there is no perfect crime. Ultimately, no matter how uh, a criminal goes to great lengths of uh, destroying their evidence, they always leave some little insignificant thing uh, behind. So if you remove the hands in order to conceal the identity, uh, surely you have forgotten about the hip replacement that has a serial number that is buried deep within a body, or maybe breast implants who have serial numbers, and, and those are all traceable, and we can ultimately very easily find uh, a victim. But what if the remains are buried deep under snow? What about a crime scene in the dead of winter? Well, basically, ever since time began, uh, man was killing man, and they seem to come up with more inventive ways as time progresses. Uh, the thing that we're finding now, we find killers that are burying their victims in shallow graves. They are uh, leaving them uh, on the side of the road. They're burning them to try and conceal the crime. And they're drowning them. There, there's a, a wide variety out there. Uh, the imagination of the criminal is a good one. That's why it's important for police officers to come up with ways to catch them that are even more inventive. Greg Olson is a police platoon commander and leader of an elite archaeological forensic recovery team in Ontario. Winter recoveries are among the team's specialties. Though a blanket of snow may hide a body from view, it won't stop investigators from searching. Okay, that's, that's it. When I refer to winter recoveries, it's something that has to be done. Our homicide investigators are very uh, intent on us trying to locate as much of the human remains as we can. It's nothing, it's not a situation that we can put off till the spring. It's something that has to be done and has to be done right away within reason. Um, if we can re locate and, and remove the main part of the deceased, then that's, that's great. So what we try and do is gather as much information of the deceased, uh, much of the remains of the deceased as we can, and, and, and any evidence that would be there that would otherwise be uh, carried away by, by animals uh, between the time we leave and come back in the spring. Specialized tents and heaters help thaw out the dump site. Okay, let's, uh, let's move over this way. Shut the, shut the door. Keep some of the heat in. Okay, this is basically the bulk of it, so let's start back over here. Let's work our way uh, east. When we're thinking about logistics and recovering human remains in the, in the four seasons, uh, obviously, in non-winter scenes, it's a much easier for us to not only to do the excavations, but to locate what we're looking for. Team members comb the site, marking the tiniest fragments of evidence. That's the main, that's the main bone pile here, anyway. Bit of on this. Mm -hmm. For a scene like today, we're going to have to look, try and locate the main, the main scene, set up a tent, melt the snow, get rid of the surface litter, and try and recover as much as we can. Almost looks like they tried to set this guy on fire. Yeah, there's a bit more over here. With the snow removed, the crime scene begins to reveal its secrets. And again, I don't, I don't see trauma at this point, but if you look at the surface, you can see that there are leaves under this, under the jeans, but there's also leaves on top. Yeah. So that's also with inclement weather like we have on days like today with the snowfall, it, uh, we have to really pull out all the stops. Uh, our homicide investigators are, uh, again, very keen to recover as much as they can to locate uh, trauma, to locate identification, uh, determine sexual um, affinity, uh, that, that kind of thing, age, race, stature, that, that kind of thing. In order to deconstruct the crime scene, the team divides the area into a series of grids. I'll put one in here at the three meter. Mapping above and below the surface. Oh, look. Oh, right here. Yep. Right there. Yeah, show. 
Today, we've had some tremendous, tremendous luck by using this system. It's uh, simple to, to employ. Uh, it's, uh, it's painstaking. Uh, you take your officers off the road for a given amount of time, but if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. The way the laws are, you only get one good kick at the can, so let's do it, let's do it right, let's do it properly. In their attempt to destroy all signs of a murder, some killers try and burn the evidence. But even the hottest fire will leave clues in the ashes. A raging fire has amazing destructive powers. It can engulf a room in a matter of minutes. Understanding what it can do to a human body is critical for crime scene investigators. Anthropologist Mariah Liston is an expert in cremated human remains, or cremains. It takes a lot of calories of heat to get a body to catch fire and then burn away, and so you have to have a large quantity of fuel. For an average adult body, it takes about two cubic meters of dry hardwood to produce enough heat together with the calories of heat produced in the burning body to completely combust it, to get it to the point that you'd be able to scatter the remains and, and hide them. To illustrate the effects of fire to future forensic experts, Liston conducts a hands-on cremation. For the purposes of the exercise, pig cadavers stand in for humans. In teaching about the cremation process, we can use pigs as a substitute for human remains because the process is very much the same. They'll burn in the same pattern. The amount of bone that survives the cremation process will be the same. And so all around, they're a very useful substitute for a human body. We want to look at a number of things, um, how long it takes, what happens to the bodies as they're in the burning process, but then also think about both in an archaeological context and in a forensic context, what it takes to burn a body, because it's actually a lot harder than most people think. A lot of times with uh, murder victims, someone's trying to hide this, they think you can throw a little gasoline on a body and light a match and it goes away. And in fact, of course, it takes a great deal more fuel to, to burn a body than, than that. No matter what kind of fire a killer uses, heat alone is never enough. In addition, it takes a long time. It's not over quickly. And if you're nervous and anxious about hiding this, and yet it takes six to eight hours to completely burn a, say, 200-pound body, that would become a little nerve-wracking, and there'd be a tendency to put the fire out quickly before the process is finished. To get enough fire to burn the body, there's no way to hide the fire. Um, it would be pretty difficult. Just think how anxious you'd be if you were trying to hide a murder rapidly here and the fire wouldn't light. More often than not, the remains themselves are still identifiable, providing investigators with plenty of clues. In a lot of forensic cases, that's what you see, is that about that condition now. And obviously nowhere near destroyed, not, not something to be easy to hide at all. Though a body has been burned and charred, many of the injuries will still show up on the bones. Stab wounds, cut marks, and bullet wounds are all visible on burned bone. One of the bodies we've got that we're burning today was shot in the head, and so we'll be able to look at the burned bullet wound on it. In addition, there are some cut marks that I put on some of the limb bones, and we'll be able to look at those as well. Even the fire will provide clues for experts. It's all a matter of knowing what to look for. Captain Silvio da Silva has been training firefighters for nearly a decade. Just about every fire has the potential to involve foul play. So um, 
we're, as firefighters and res emergency responders, we have to be very conscious that perhaps um, we may be destroying evidence if we move the wrong thing. And just about every fire that we, we go to, we tend to think that perhaps there's a possibility that it could be arson. So we have to be very careful. 